Now, real quick here, I'd like to introduce uh, Dave Gorski. Dave is how where I connected with this effort. I just thought you might have a word or two of welcome and maybe introduce our first speaker. Well, it's great to see so many friends here. Um, <clears throat> hopefully, this will be the start of something coming together. Um, our first guest today is Julie De La Terre. Um, she works at the Turbo University as an environmental educator. And uh, she's going to speak to us today about a model developed in Stockholm, Sweden, it's on there, okay, <laughs> called the Nine Planetary Boundaries. So, uh, big hand for Julie. That was really cool having the, that drum played over there because I could see the trees out the window and the trees were dancing. <laughs> and I'm reminded how everything is alive. We are the only living creatures on this planet. Those trees are alive, the soil's alive. First Nations even believe that rocks are alive. It's all about relationship. And I tried to figure out how to play into this model because this is a model that was developed by scientists all over the world in this day and age. But it's about something that First Nations have known since the beginning of humankind. And that we're all connected. All the systems are connected. We're connected to all the Earth systems and they're connected to us. So I was trying to think of a metaphor of trying to understand global systems, which I'm going to go through today. I'm going to throw a lot of stuff at you. Just remember where I got the information so you can find it out when I'm done, because it's probably going to be too much to digest. But a metaphor is our own bodies. A lot of our bodies are water, over 70%, right? Our blood is like a river. It's like rivers in our, in our arteries and in our veins. If our blood is contaminated with pollution, it affects us. It makes us sick. If we breathe things in the air into our bodies, that will kill us. If they're toxic, it will make us sick. If we could remember that the earth is like our own bodies, we're part of the earth and the earth is part of us, would we want to pollute the blood of the earth? Would we want to shove polluted air into every living system on this earth and expect it to be healthy? Would we come up with what these experts say? Here I teach at a university, but I'm going to be cutting down the experts. We can handle so much of these toxins in our, in our bodies before we get sick. How do they know? And then how do they know how much of these toxins the earth is able to handle? How far can we push these systems? You know what? We don't know until the earth becomes sick. And you know what? We are already sick because of what we're doing to the planet. One out of every four people is going to get cancer in their lifetimes. The number of children with autism is off the charts. There's people that can't breathe in every large urban center because of air pollution. Everything that's happening to us is happening to the planet. It's not that big of a stretch to figure that out. We manifest the planet and the planet manifests us. So what I'm going to talk about today is the non-planetary boundaries, which are developed in Stockholm, Sweden, like uh, David said. And uh, they consulted scientists all over the world, but they came up with the idea in Sweden, which is cool. I mean, Sweden was the world's greenest country at one point. They got the uh, award for that. It's how to understand the ecological system changes that can lead to a regime shift. A regime is something that's going on in an ecological landscape that's stable over time. It has its ups and downs, but it always goes back to center. If you know statistics, it's within two standard deviations of the norm. Just like our lives, sometimes they're stressed, sometimes they're not, but we can always kind of regroup and still survive, okay? That's a regime shift. I'm trying to make this simple, but I, you know, I don't know how well I'm going to do. The current uh, coral bleaching in the Great Barrier Reef, which I'm sure everyone's heard about here, 35% of them dead, they're not going to come back. That's a regime shift for that coral reef. It's not going to be able to come back because of what's happening in the oceans. This is, uh, and I, I mentioned the Stockholm Resiliency Center here, but I'll mention it, I'll mention it again at the end. Here's the nine planetary boundaries. Um, I'm going to try to uh, explain it to you, but at the end, if there's anything you didn't quite understand, I'm hoping to have a few minutes you can ask me some questions. Number one, stratospheric ozone depletion. That's the ozone hole. Number two, biodiversity loss. That's the massive extinction that's going on all over the planet. Number three, chemical pollution. They don't have measures for that, but we know there's over 80,000 registered chemicals in use right now. Wow, what an experiment. Climate change, we all know about that. Five, ocean acidification. I hope you all know what that means. Freshwater exploitation, that's what we're dealing with in the central sands. 
land use changes, that's what we're dealing with in the central sands. Nitrogen phosphorus flows, that's what we're dealing with in the central sands. Atmospheric aerosol loading, that's what we're dealing with in the central sands. You know, pretty much everything here has to do with what's going on here, except the ozone hole. So here's an a image of the planetary boundaries. I don't really know how clear it is to you all. Um, and I don't have a pointer either, so it's kind of hard to show you. But the green area in the center is the safe operating zone, and it goes out to that blue circle. Can everybody see this, or is this just really fuzzy? Okay, and then there's another circle that's kind of red. That's the danger zone, all right? Once you pass that, you're out of, you're out of control. Huh, look at that, biogeomic chemical flows. Guess what that is? Nitrogen and phosphorus pollution. We're out of control. So all these CAFOs, all the stuff that we're dealing with, that's a big deal globally. Another one is biosphere integrity. That means that we're in the sixth greatest extinction right now. We're, we've lost more, and we've lost half of all the animals on the planet in my lifetime. I am ashamed to tell children that. They're not gonna be able to see the animals that I saw as a child. That's ridiculous. It's insane. And then you can see there's some other ones that we're getting close to that danger zone. We have land system change. Well, that's massive agriculture. That's what we're talking about. Mining, massive agriculture, tar sands in Alberta. It's pushing us right to the danger zone. Another one that's getting close to it is climate change. Actually, the land use change is more to the danger zone than the climate change is. Then we got novel entities. That's chemicals that I mentioned. They don't have any measures for that. That's why they don't show the danger zone. They don't know how much pollution we can take before we collapse. Stratospheric ozone, they dealt with that with the Montreal Protocol. And that means a bunch of countries got together and stopped putting chlorofluorocarbons into the ozone layer. But mm, I don't know, I still see that stuff getting used. So I'm really not sure what's going on up there over the Antarctic. Atmospheric aerosol loading, that's any particles that end up in the atmosphere. So uh, pollution from the pipes of trucks, cars, whatever, um, anything that shoves it up there, that's an aerosol. And then ocean acidification, that's when the, car the carbon dioxide gets absorbed into the ocean and becomes carbonic acid. And when there's too much carbonic acid and the pH changes, then carbonate is not available for the, micro for the microorganisms or clams or whatever that needs a lot of carbon for their shells to be in the ocean, which will collapse the food supply for the, f for the fish and everything else in the ocean. And then we've got the fresh freshwater use, that's a big deal too. Um, they don't even have us out to the, the first blue line, but I think that might be changing quickly, the way that we keep poking holes in the ground. So this one might be a little easier to see. So you can see that again. This is another graphic. You can see that the sixth greatest extinction is going on, nitrogen and phosphorus pollution, and land system change, and climate change. Those are the four. Two are out of control, and two have uh, approached the danger zone. So I call it climate chaos, other people call it climate, cha uh, climate change. So uh, we were at 280 parts per million for a long, long time. Millenniums, right? So within the last 150 years, we've gone to 390, and then where they're measuring it, I can't remember where it is, it's now up to 400. Uh, it's past the boundary of several Earth systems. Those are the Earth systems that I put up there, nine planetary boundary uh, Earth systems. And we can see that because there's a loss of uh, sea ice, polar sea ice, it's a well-defined threshold. It has a rapid physical feedback mechanism, and it leads to higher sea levels. It can weaken or reverse carbon sinks. A carbon sink is, a forest is a carbon sink. It'll take in carbon and hold it. And uh, if you mess with uh, the atmosphere, you can affect how forests hold carbon, release carbon. And what we do, rainforest loss, cutting down forests, burning the wood on the ground, that's putting the carbon back into the atmosphere. We don't know how long before it's irreversible. So here's, I don't know how we're doing on time. Does anybody give me, how, how many minutes of my end, David? Five? Okay, so climate chaos, this is how they measure it. It's not really showing up very well, so I'm probably gonna have to read a little bit of it. They measure climate chaos by measuring the CO2 co uh, concentration, but they also measure watts per square meter on the planet's surface. And that's the radiation coming in and staying at the planet's surface. And I maintain that if we covered every flat roof with solar panels, we would actually reduce the amount of watts coming in onto the planet's surface. So, um, 
So we don't want to get above 500, 550 parts per million on the CO2 because that is game over for all of us. So we're trying to avoid that. That's why the 350.org um, organization exists right now. Stratospheric ozone depletion. Ozone's up uh, on the poles, filters out ultraviolet radi radiation. If we get too much of it, we're going to get cancer. And it also has its effects on every other living thing on this planet. Uh, there was a hole. And they tried to make an agreement to, to decrease the size of the hole. As far as I know, it's still there. And the limits seem to be working for now. But that could change. That's what's interesting about climate chaos. It can change very rapidly. And here's how they measure it. They measure O3. Ozone is oxygen 3. Instead of two, molecules, or two atoms, you get three atoms of oxygen. And I can't go into how this works, but it really does keep the ultraviolet ra radiation from the ground. I put this up here because I thought it would help you understand, but since it's all fuzzy, we'll just keep going. Biodiversity loss, extinctions. Well, we've seen that. Anybody in this room that's been watching the animal communities over the last several decades could tell that we're losing butterflies, insects, birds, er every conceivable thing out there. Except the generalists like the uh, starlings and uh, the raccoons and rats. They're around. Um, <laughs> The last time they did a, a total assessment was the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment in 2005, so we're 11 years out on that. But what they came up with is in the last 50 years, that's been the most rapid ecosystem change. It's abrupt and irreversible. And it's happening because there's a huge demand for food, water, and I don't call them natural resources, I call them natural gifts. There's a huge demand for that by the Earth's population. Change is steady and increasing, so the land use changes that are happening over time on the planet's surface are either steady or increasing, but they're not declining. That's one of the problems. You can slow the loss by protecting living systems, and one way to do that is to give them value, restoring habitat, and provide connectivity before, between areas of habitat. Um, there are islands of habitat across the landscape, but if the animals can't go from one island to the other, they're, they're not going to uh, be able to do that well because they need to mix with each other and move the genetics up and down. So one way to really deal with keeping animal and plant populations healthy is to connect the islands. So this is a whole, you could, you could spend years reading what people have said about this. Because as you saw when I began talking, that is the biggest decline, that and nitrogen and phosphorus loading. So any, if you're part of any conservation um, organization, or you've got your own land and you're holding it, or you're trying to make the land healthy again, or you're trying to clean up the water, or you're trying to, you know, you are doing like some of the most important work, if not the most important work on the planet right now. And see, here's the loss of species. They're just looking at the extinction rate. They call it a slow variable because they don't like go extinct overnight but impact on many other boundaries, carbon storage, freshwater, nitrogen and phosphorus cycles, land systems, massive loss of biodiversity, unacceptable, unacceptable for ethical reasons. And I buy that. It's unethical. And then we have uh, chemical pollution. So, all right, here's one of my big ones. Um, yeah, so I said there's over 80,000 chemicals registered out there. Uh, when you start looking into it, you find that the EPA has only tested like less than 100. And uh, there's 10,000 chemicals used in our food system, and the EPA has tested less than 100. So they're throwing a lot of stuff at us, not only in our environment, but in our food supply. So it's something to really pay attention to. And if you, I can go through this here, but just a word of advice, go through your own household and get rid of everything that fits one of these uh, categories that I'm talking about on here. And dispose of it in the right, in the right manner and use things that are either going to biodegrade in the environment or not cause harm to you or the planet's creatures. So what's really a problem is toxic long-lived substances, things that don't break down over time, or if they do, it's a special bacteria that take a long time to do it. Now we all know radiation breaks down. There's no bacteria that breaks down radiation. That just has half-lives. So persistent organic pollutants, that's, they call them POPs, and that would be the chemicals used in the agricultural systems. Those are persistent because they go onto the fields, they run into the water supply, they persist in the water supply, and they affect all the critters in the surface water supply and eventually will end up in our aquifers and then we get to drink them. I have atrazine in my well water and probably nitrates too. Heavy metals, well, my goodness, heavy metals are coming every time we dig into the ground, every time we sand mine, every time we rip open the earth, 
We're going to find heavy metals coming out. All fossil fuel exploration has heavy metals associated with it. Fossil fuel combustion, especially coal combustion with a lot of mercury, we're bringing up those heavy metals. You know, the earth put it under the ground to keep us safe, and we're bringing it up and putting us and all creation at risk. Radioactive materials, well, boy, the U.S. just loves that stuff. I went to a nuclear conference in Madison a few years back, and they just thought it was the cat's pajamas. Let's just, let's just build some small nuclear reactors under the surface of the Earth so nobody can see when they melt down. They're called them twin packs. Kind of weird people there. Irreversible effects on biological and physical systems. Yeah, we don't even know, because now that they're finding even at parts per billion, they're endocrine disruptors. Endocrine disruptors affect your hormones affect your reproduction. It can, even one part per billion of certain substances will mess up insects' way, uh, uh, signaling system to find mates and all of a sudden the whole population will collapse. So I read a paper how it was collapsing like garden spider populations and I've got toxic farming around me and I no longer have any garden spiders. And that was in five years. So anecdotally, my entire 14 acre organic farm has completely had a regime shift just because I had a toxic farm come around me and it only took six years. So I'm telling you, it doesn't take very long. Bioaccumulation, that means if there's some in the first critter that gets eaten by the second one, it's the next one all the way up to the tenth thing that eats it, those things get stuck in their tissues and that's, that's the story of PCBs. Genetic damage, now we all know what that is, and it reduces bird populations. Remember Rachel Carson in Silent Spring, she's right. It's happening now. She's right, it's getting quieter. I've read reports about um, a couple of people, uh, sound recorders going out into the environment over the last four decades, and it's getting quieter and quieter and quieter. So Rachel's right. Impaired development of young, and here at Science Spring is happening. We gotta listen to her. I had a little poster with her on today. I should have brought it. So how they measure chemical pollution is emissions, concentrations, or effects on ecosystem. And then earth system functioning with persistent organic pollutants, plastics, endocrine disruptors, heavy metals, nuclear waste. So that's just some of them. There's tons of stuff out there. You could spend years finding out about that too. But one note, it really, really gets my goiter when I go to a hardware store and they've got these weed and feed products right when you come in the store. Those, stuff, that, those bags are full of toxic chemicals. And anybody who's at least slightly sensitive, could get sick just passing by those bags because I can smell them off-gassing. I can't tell you how many hardware stores I've gone into and said, why are you putting this toxic stuff right by the front door? Everybody's got to smell it when they come through. Plus, they shouldn't even be selling it. It's unethical. Ocean acidification. It's a quarter of all anthropogenic, that means human-caused CO2, a quarter of all of that gets absorbed into the ocean. It forms carbonic acid, like I said before, reduces the availability of carbonate ions, which is a building block of marine species bodies. So you're going to end up with a loss of species. You're going to end up with a change of structure and dynamics in the ocean system, which will lead to the reduction of fish stocks. Ocean acidity, ocean acidity is up 30%. It affects the oceans and uh, CO2 excess. CO2 affects the oceans and the atmosphere. And I think it probably has something to do with why that uh, coral bleached down uh, by Australia. So how they measure it is uh, the carbonite ion concentration and the average global surface ocean saturation in respect to aragonite. So there is a, um, a chemical out there called aragonite that they use for measuring this. And you can dig into this by going to the Stockholm Resiliency Center and they have a ton of information there to understand any of these nine planetary boundaries that I'm trying to unpack for you right now. Well, we all know about fresh water consumption. It seems like some people get to use a lot of it and some people get to lose it. So a fresh water cycle strongly affected by climate, major human effects by the human modification of water bodies. Well, not just bodies, but taking it out of the ground too. I didn't have that in here, but damming rivers, digging wells, and the crops that you grow, because corn, I read a report about corn, corn will tr transpire so much water into the atmosphere during its growing day that'll actually affect the weather. So since I moved where I moved about two decades ago, the weather has changed on my ridge. And it's kind of anecdotal, but there's a heck of a lot more corn up there. So all of a sudden my weather's changing. It's really kind of strange. So shifts and flows can be abrupt and irreversible, and water is becoming increasingly scarce. We know that. 
China's coming in and taking water out of the Great Lakes. They're po poking holes all over and making water companies, which by the way, water companies don't have any regulations, so you don't know what you're doing when you drink a bottle of water. So I would suggest everyone in here to get a filter and filter your own water. I wouldn't trust corporations one bit. So we need a global water boundary, and we have to deal with cascading local regional thresholds. So you can have a problem here with a certain way that water is uh, monitored or dealt with, which may be way different than something somewhere else. So it's very, it, very idiosyncratic for the particular area where these issues are happening. So you can't make broad judgments about water. So global uh, freshwater use is measure, measured by uh, cubic kilometers per year. And uh, let's see, zone of uncertainty is 4,000 cubic kilometers. Kilometers? Holy smokes, that's big. That's like a square mile. That's amazing. Yeah, and uh, mines use a lot of water, so I think we should stop mining everything right now. Actually, I call uh, toxic farmers, I call them uh, land miners. Land system change. Human impacts on the land. It's the hugest effect. If you go up and you look at the Earth from a satellite, you can see what we are doing to the surface of the planet. We're destroying forests, grasslands, wetlands, anything we can get our hands on. And you know what? When you take everything out and grow one crop, that's ecocide. That's destroying everything there. So like I said, it's like, it's like uh, mining. It has impacts on water flows. It, have imp it has impacts on carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus cycles. And we need to assess the impacts of quantity, function, and distribution of land change. Forest integrity is the most important of all. That's why it's the only thing you're going to find in bullet point in this presentation. The um, last climate change uh, meeting in Paris, they came out with the most important thing, and that was global forests. We need to preserve what we have and plant as fast as we can, as much as we can, wherever we can, because forests are the single most important issue, pl uh, plant, organism, thing that'll help us on this planet. We need to be planting trees all over, all the time, in massive amounts, because they sequester carbon and they have huge implications on every environment that they live in, every place, from the tops of mountains all the way down to the mangroves. So that's a whole other body of research. So how they measured that is a percentage of global land cover converted to crop land. It's a trigger of irreversible and widespread conversion of biomes to undesired states. Primarily acts as a slow variable affecting carbon storage and resilience via changes in biodiversity and landscape heterogeneity. That means variability. And I haven't even talked about resilience yet, so I, have, so I hope I have enough time. <laughs> all right, nitrogen and phosphorus flows going into the environment. We all know about nitrogen and phosphorus. Uh, humans convert a lot of nitrogen in the atmosphere to nitrogen fertilizer through the Huber process, which came out of Germany. Uh, so I'll just leave this up here and tell you that we've got way too much nitrogen out there. A lot of it ends up in surface water and phosphorus, which is what I wrote my master's degree about. Nine-tenths of all the phosphorus that's spread on the land ends up running off and into the waterways. And then we end up in dead zones. We've got a dead zone in Green Bay, and we've got a huge one in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, it's hard to see this, but this is the nitrogen that's applied in the world. You can see a lot of it over there, a lot in Europe, a lot in, uh, over there in Asia, and a lot right in the top of India. But that's where most of it's being put. There's a lot in the United States. That's phosphorus. Look at how much red is in the United States, and Wisconsin is completely red. So we got to get a handle on the nitrogen and phosphorus pollution. I think this might be the last boundary. Atmospheric aerosol loading, that's particles in the atmosphere. They interact with water. They affect cloud formation. They affect circulation. They affect monsoons. When there's pollution in China, it ends up causing a drought in the Sahel for 20 years where over a million people die. That's, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about atmosphere. This stuff moves around and affects weather thousands of miles from where it originates. Amount of solar radiation reflected or absorbed. Okay, so what are those chemtrails up in the sky? Oh, they're putting them up there to reflect the light back because they're trying to keep the earth uh, cool. Dust and smoke. It causes almost over a million deaths a year, and it's a very complex system. It's very hard for the scientists to study it because it's so uh, mobile and complicated. All right, so uh, in Beijing, it's so, so dirty that you have to watch the sun come up on a screen. All right, people die there by the droves from atmospheric pollution. 
but they no longer have a sunrise in Beijing, and I really don't want that to happen anywhere else, because that is just really sick. It's inconceivable to me. They never see the sun, and obviously they never see the moon, so, wow. Anyway, so, I, what I've been talking about is the Stockholm Resiliency Center. That's how it's spelled. You go online, look it up. They've got tons and tons and tons of information there. You can even talk to them yourself. But what I'm saying is that the Earth is a bunch of systems, just like our body is a bunch of systems, unless we understand how it's all interconnected and how to heal it and heal ourselves, we're not going to be making much progress. I don't want to be like um, a do downer here. I'm not a downer. If everyone in this room becomes an Earth healer and understands it at a real deep level, we can pass that on to our comrades, our communities, and whatever we do, because we need to look at it this way. We need to be system thinkers. The First Nations people have always been system thinkers. Now it's time for us to catch up. So that's it, and thank you.